morning, Molly Barncat. How's it going there, sweetie? How are you doing, huh? So today I feel like I need to address the question of whether or not it's ethical to own barn cats. Because here on our farm, we have three barn cats. We have Pablo barn cat, our original barn cat on the farm. We have Molly barn cat, who you just met over there. And we have little Ginny barn cat, who's a kitten of about five months old, who's actually also Molly's daughter. And much like our livestock guardian dog, Toby. Hey buddy, how are you? Did you have a good night, huh? You doing good? Did you have a good evening? Yeah? Our barn cats are working animals. They're not just here because they're pets. It's not to say that we don't like them and we don't treat them really well and spoil them, but they have a job here on Goldshaw Farm. Good morning, little bucket duck too. Okay, girl, it's okay. You see, this little gal has contracted a case of bumblefoot. She's the second duck I've had get bumblefoot this year. I've been giving her the same duck bumblefoot treatment that I give all my ducks, which is I soak their feet for a daily basis for a couple of weeks. Usually it gets better. Bumblefoot comes from a number of things. You know, they can get a cut on their foot, they can get infected. You, if you have unsanitary conditions, that can cause a problem. Given the amount of space my animals have access to, my guess is she probably got a cut and it got infected. So when that happens, you gotta take care of your animals. Release the Kraken! Good morning, chickens. Because I have so many birds on my farm, and because most of those birds need to be fed, most of those birds end up getting fed grain. <laughs> And that grain ends up getting spilled on the ground and that spilled grain ends up attracting rodents. And when you have rodents, you attract ticks, you attract predators like coyotes and foxes and bobcats. And it's just really not all that good for your farm. And so that's why having barn cats like Mr. Pablo Barncat here are really important for our farm. They help keep our farm hygienic and they help keep our farm predator free. And plus, they're ever so soft to pet. They really are the perfect cranky co-workers to offset the over-exuberance of Mr. Toby Dog. But that's not to say that the barn cats don't come with their own baggage. And some might argue that a barn cat does more harm than good. So while barn cats do an amazing job of managing all the rodents that we have around the farm, they also will occasionally kill a songbird or two. And in fact, some folks would point to studies that would show that domestic house cats that are outdoors, whether they be feral or cats that just people let go outside, contribute to the extinction of a whole bunch of different songbird varieties. So that means I'm kind of torn when it comes to having barn cats on our farm. Come with me, Molly Murder Mittens. It's time to feed you. Yeah, I'm just feeding you today, Molly. No food for Ginny. I hear you, little Jin Jin. Hey, come here. I actually had to put little Ginny barn cat in lockdown today, or actually last night, I should say because she needs to go to the vet because she's getting fixed today. Yeah, little Ginny is clearly not happy to be going to the vet right now, but it's really important that she goes to the vet right now. You know, because she's about five months old at this point, she really is due to get um, fixed, meaning, you know, so that she can't have any more babies. That's one of the more important rules I have for being an ethical barn cat owner, which I wanna try to outline for you guys in this video but I probably won't do it in the truck here because Ginny's very unhappy about riding a long shotgun. Come on, little Ginny. Okay. So Ginny is set to get spayed. I gotta come back here later today to pick her up. She'll probably be a little groggy and a little bit cranky, but I think it's totally worth it because I think it's actually very important 
to make sure that your barn cats can't reproduce. In fact, that's my first rule of ethical barn cat keeping. You know, if you're gonna have barn cats, you have to make sure that you can control their populations. You know, part of why outdoor cats are such an ecological nightmare is because they can often reproduce unchecked. When you have feral cats that are out there, even if you have own cats that aren't fixed, you have this risk of them reproducing in ways that their owners don't necessarily want. That reproduction means more cats. More cats means more pressure on the native wildlife, and that creates the problems. And so that's why all of our barn cats are 100% or at least 100% once Ginny gets fixed, fixed. I know some people would love to have, say, the offspring of Pablo Barncat, but unfortunately I can't in good conscience do that. There are enough cats in this world that if we ever need another barn cat, we can just adopt a cat. It's not too hard to do. And so I always ensure that my cats cannot reproduce. That is the first rule of ethical barn cat keeping. Now, before I go into the other rules about ethical barn cat keeping, I wanna just take a moment to mention our video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in creativity. Skillshare is specifically curated for learning, meaning there are no ads and there's always new premium classes that they're launching. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. Regardless of your level of expertise, Skillshare has courses that will match where you are at. You know, just the other day, I took an Ali Abdal productivity masterclass. I found it hugely helpful. You know, I'm so often trying to juggle so many things in my life. My day job, the farm, YouTube, having a personal life. It's so hard to try to balance it all. And Ali's class offered me some great ideas on how I can become more efficient and make all of the parts of my life work together. I learned a lot and I'm super appreciative of it. Skillshare offers membership with meaning. Connect with the support of fellow creatives and enter a community of encouragement, communication, and inspiration. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description of this video will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Check it out. So if the first rule of ethical barn cat keeping is to manage the number of barn cats that you have and make sure that you control their populations and that they don't explode, the second role is you need to manage where they go. And to do that, there are a couple things that we do on our farm very specifically to make sure that our barn cats don't wander too far. And in particular, make sure that our barn cats aren't out there attacking the bird populations. The first thing, and I know it seems novel, is that I feed my barn cats regularly. I make sure that Pablo, Molly, and Ginny all get two square meals a day, and Pablo, because he's a little bit of a lard butt, ends up getting a little bit more than that because he is always trying to steal Toby's food. Pablo, you're not learning at all. But what that does is, specifically, it keeps them from ranging too far. They know that they wanna stay close to the farm because they know that they have an easy meal right here around the farm. That keeps them wandering too far around the neighborhood. That keeps them wandering too far into the pasture where they could attack birds. And it also keeps them safe by keeping them from wandering into the woods where they could become the prey of something else. You know, coyotes and bobcats in particular would love to prey on a domestic cat. And so I need to be careful in where they go if I wanna make sure that they live a long time. But by feeding my barn cats on a regular basis, what I'm able to do is have them focus in on this area as their home. And they really anchor to this place. Part one is the feeding. And part two is I actually train them to the barn. If you guys remember, I spent more than a month where I had Molly and Ginny living inside a room inside the barn. I didn't let them range around the farm. I waited until I got uh, Molly fixed, and that's when I let them go out and be free. That period of time of being in there and living in there and connecting with me is part of why they're so attached to the farm now, because I've trained them to understand that this area is home. And so if you ever get a new barn cat of your own, I would strongly recommend that you find a room, that you let them live in that room for a couple of weeks, get them anchored to it, and then they're gonna see it as a safe space. That's how you ensure that your barn cats stay here. I think too often, people will let their cats roam without ever thinking about where those cats end up going. And that's where you get some of those problems. The third element that I have in my ethical barn cat keeping plan is that I make sure that I have some balance. Yes, around this area of the farm where I have, especially the, the bird housing, as well as our barn and over by our house, is not a great place for songbirds. It just 
isn't. If they hang out there too much, they probably will get attacked by one of our barn cats. But what I've tried to do is make sure that I'm creating habitat further away from the farm that's better suited for them. So for example, our permaculture orchard provides feed for birds. Our pasture, I try to keep longer than I need to so that the birds, especially the songbirds, have good nesting habitat. And it really is my attempt to try to create a net neutral proposition. Look, I am by no means saying that my barn cats don't do some measure of ecological damage and that my barn cats don't necessarily attack songbirds because they do. But what I'm trying to do is limit and mitigate as well as bolster and support the populations in other ways around our farm. You know, that's why I'm so focused on making a large portion of our farm wildlife habitat. By doing that, I feel like I'm trying to keep a balance with maybe the unnatural elements that I have here on my farm. It's not perfect, I know that, but it's my attempt to try to do better than nothing at all. And it's my attempt to try to be in some sort of measure of balance. You know, there's other solutions I could potentially have when it comes to controlling the rodent population around the farm. You know, one example would be I could resort to poisons and, and use like poisons around the barn and around the poultry area that could kill the, the rodents that are around here. But I see that as a significant negative because then you've got poisoned animals wandering around the, the wild landscape here. And those animals could get eaten by a raptor or those animals could get eaten by a coyote and then that poison's transferred to the animal that eats the the rodent that's eaten the poison. That to me is, seems like a horrible solution. You know another way I could go that I know some people have sometimes suggested is rather than using cats using dogs. You know we already used Mr. Toby Dog here on our farm to help manage certain things. Why not use like a couple of terriers to take care of the rodent population? But the reality is terriers are great when it comes to rats. Terriers. They're not nearly as good when it comes to mice and voles, which are by far the predominant animals that we have as rodents that are wandering around the pasture. And then the other issue is when it comes to a terrier or terriers, I have to really manage where they are and where they go. And that's a lot of uh, oversight required by me, the farmer, versus my barn cats generally work pretty well independently. And so maybe someday I'll experiment with using a terrier around here on the farm to help control rodents, but I don't foresee that anytime in the future. I think the other risk is an animal like a terrier has a high prey drive. That high prey drive means that things like chickens or geese might look like prey as well, and I could have to worry about issues with dog bird violence. Probably the biggest issue I have and the single biggest risk I have for the health of our barn cats here around our farm that I do struggle with and I still don't have a great solution for is the road. The area where I'm standing in right now is set relatively far back from the road, so there's no issues here. But we have a road in front of our farm and the house isn't that far from the road. And because of that, there is a risk of a barn cat getting hit by a car. I've tried to discourage them from going up in the front of the house as much as possible. It's not perfect, but I think I'm doing okay. You know, we had to learn that lesson really the hard way last year when Lil Barn Cat got hit by a car and she almost died. That's why Lil Barn Cat to this day is an indoor cat because uh, just after her injuries, she just wasn't quite the same and didn't have the same amount of abilities and, and let me feel confident in letting her be kind of free and wild around the farm. It's unfortunate that that's the way things had to go, but it is probably the safest, best way to keep her. And so she's an indoor cat. I love having her as an indoor cat, but that's definitely a risk I worry about with our other barn cats of, of some sort of issue like that in the future. And I'm trying to do my best to protect against it. Okay, don't worry, little Jin Jin. We're gonna take you home. By the way, I just wanna say a shout out and thank you to my friend who sent me this cat carrier. She was so kind to send it. It's really coming in handy. The cat's like this better than the other one I have. Come on, Gingy. In we go, Gingin. Here we go. You're in your house now. <laughs> you burn like a motorboat there, sweetie. Hey, take it easy, take it easy. We don't want you jumping. Here we go. Gotta give your stitches a little time to heal, huh? Ooh, isn't that your favorite? Yes, it is. And you haven't eaten all day, I know. Little Ginny loves to eat. I think she's high on drugs. <laughs> so yeah, Ginny Barncat's surgery went well. She's officially spayed, so she cannot have kittens now at this point. She's gonna actually have to spend the next seven to 10 days inside this room, inside the barn. It's already been cat-proofed. This is where, if you guys recall, where she and her mom spent the first month on the farm. They were living inside this room, so it's actually a familiar place. 
It's also actually where at night, like or even during the day when I catch them napping and sleeping, they usually come up to this room to sleep. So it's a good spot for her to be in. She needs to stay inside like this for the next seven to 10 days so that her surgery can heal up and I can make sure she doesn't get infected and just keep an eye on things. She seems to be a pretty happy kitty. So I think all's well that is ending well. Did you look at her? It's so adorable the way she's even eating right now, which is kind of weird. She doesn't usually do that. Oh, you did a good job today, Jenny. I'm very proud of you. So I am curious to hear where you guys land on this great barn cat debate. Are you pro barn cat? Are you against barn cat? If you want to leave your comments down below, I'm very curious to see what you got to say. Thanks for watching, everybody.